have you ever kind of sat with your emotions and thought, God, I don't know how to process this. I don't even know how I'm feeling. That's actually what we're going to talk about today. And we're going to talk about not just how you can feel it, but we're going to talk about ways that people find that are coping that may not be in their best interest in the form of self-harm. Let's chat about it right now. Check it out. Hey, everybody, and welcome back to episode 28 of the Positivity Experience. I am your host, Lori, and I hope that you guys are having a great summer, especially for up here in the Northern Hemisphere, where it's like been super hot and a little bit of crazy weather going on here. But to my lovely friends in Australia and everyone in the Southern Hemisphere, I want to thank you guys so much for your support, everybody, for your support, of course. But down there, I just want to send you guys some warm vibes because I know right now it's not as warm for you as it is for us here. So I just wanted to reach out and tell you guys how much I appreciate you and appreciate you guys tuning in uh, just about every week. And uh, wow, I mean, that just is is such an it's so amazing to me. And it's such a blessing. And just want to thank you guys for that and let you know that I have great, great gratitude for you. So this week is going to be a little bit of a harder topic for some. Okay, so I do want to kind of throw out there that if you get triggered by um, self harm, if you get triggered by cutting, burning, Uh, banging your head, pulling out hair, um, and even some forms of eating disorders. If that is a trigger for you, you may actually want to consider skipping this podcast um, because I am going to talk to you about it from my personal perspective. Um, You know, a little bit of technicalities as well, but definitely for sure from the from the personal perspective. So just kind of giving you a heads up on that. So let's jump into it. So here's the deal. When we hear emotions, right? When you hear I am angry, I am going, which you know, is just a word. It's just a describer. So when you hear anger, you say, okay, this is how I'm angry. I'm going to process this. And to be fair, emotions are hard for all of us to process. I mean, they just are. I mean, barring the fact that somebody put you on a private jet and you have a million dollars in your bank. And honestly, I think even then that may be hard, right? You just, you get this windfall of money and you're not used to it. You're like, oh my God, this is great. But then do you really know how to actually like, process that, right? And so allowing yourself that space to say, oh my goodness, you know, let me sit with this and process it. Well, that seems like a normal kind of everyday experience that we have. However, that is not the experience for a lot of people. And it's a lot more than you actually think. So, you know, when you think of self-harm, immediately you may think of cutting, you may think of burning, you may think of various things. And for me, mine was actually my binge eating. And I know a lot of people are like, wait, that's an eating disorder. That's a little different from self-harm. But for me, um, while it wasn't an intentional thing that I was going in to harm myself, when I struggle any part of my eating disorder, I definitely struggle with, okay, I need to have control or I'm not staying in the present space. So there is that form of satisfaction. So for me, that became a version of self-harm. And, you know, again, I mean, I have to keep it at bay almost every day, right? Like I really have to work with it and I have to allow myself, um, the compassion, right? To just sit with and be like, okay, there is something deeper that obviously, I mean, I've dealt with so much all of my life. However, this does not mean that things just go away. So this also, not just from an eating disorder perspective, but also in any mental health, it runs on my side of the family. And, you know, it's really, really hard when you're a parent of someone who is inflicting self-harm upon themselves. And so it, when, in my house, that's in the version of um, cutting, right? And it, it's not just cutting, it's, you know, sometimes it's um, it hitting herself or running her head into the wall or because she's having a difficult time processing her emotions. And yeah, sure, 14 years old, it seems to be a pretty, and it can be earlier, a little bit of a standard time for things like this to take in effect, all right? And it is a process. Oh my God. I listen, I and and I have tools to to cope mentally, right? A lot of people don't have these coping strategies to kind of work through the fact that it's out of your control when you're seeing somebody else inflict wounds upon themselves, right? Like you're not physically watching it, but you're seeing it after the fact. And so this is a a fairly new thing um, that, well, I'm sorry, new to me um, that has been happening. And it was a lot to take in. For sure. Um, And, you know, that's why I tell you guys all the time, allow your emotions to come. 
any time that you're listening to any of the content, whether it be on the podcast, whether it be on TikTok or YouTube, it doesn't matter. I'm just because I'm trying to get you guys to stay present and have self love does not mean I'm asking you guys not to feel your emotions. The only thing that I am helping to guide you with is to not fall into that deeper spiral of these emotions, right? So for me, um, it, you know, it's taken me a long time. Uh, I mean, a lot of work, I should say, uh, and learning uh, on why people uh, possibly go down that road of cutting. And uh, it is something that we're still in the process of figuring out how to, I don't know, get a handle on it, for a lack of a better term, because that's kind of where we are here. And it's so important that you do not react in a negative fashion. I understand when you see that, when you see markings, when you see cuts, when you see that, you immediately, most people want to be like, what in the actual hell? Like that's like, what? whoa, like what the hell? And you have to understand, remember, you get a little angry and anger is fear, frustration and hurt, right? And that I feel is a normal response in your brain, but you have got to make sure that you do not come across to your child as though you are mortified or that you are embarrassed or that you are shocked or that you, you got to really reel it in, right? Because immediately what's going to happen for most parents, especially I want to say moms, right? Uh, but parents in general, but I want to say moms, is you go into, oh my God, how did we get here? What did I do to make this happen? Um, how can I fix this? Um, what did I do wrong? Like, so you have to realize a lot of times we internalize these things. And I, I want you to realize that this is a normal reaction. I just don't want you to put it in front of your child, right? Like, you know, it was tough for me. Good day and a half of crying. Solid, solid crying. But not, you know, just, you know, what could I have done different? You know, going down that rabbit hole. And, you know, I mean, she struggles with depression anyway. But I honestly feel, and, you know, we're in the process of, of getting a re-diagnosis actually this week. And because I'm, I'm really going to push for that because I do basically know what I think I see um, as far as a diagnosis, but I can't diagnose because I'm not her psychiatrist and I don't want to diagnose my own child. But you have to understand there's multitude of reasons why self-harm comes into play, but a lot of it is emotion regulation right? It's, it's not understanding the emotion. It's feeling out of control of the emotion. And very often when the wound is inflicted, it is creating this, I don't want to say it's an illusion, but the feeling of these endorphins of, it's almost like a release. In turn, that can become rather addicting and compulsive, right? And so now you want to, you want to do it more because it ultimately is relieving some kind of pain. And, or you want to go deeper because it's not quite as good as it once was, right? And that is just about with everything. And the biggest factor in that is understanding that there's always going to be something deeper going on there. Now, is there um, a scenario on the planet where it's like, well, my friends are doing it, let me do it too. Um, I want to be really careful on that because I don't want you to, and this is so imperative. I don't want you to look and be like, well, this is new. Like pff, who the hell have you been hanging out with? Oh, Tiffany down the street, she's been cutting and now you're cutting. What are you trying to be like her? Like you want to be extremely careful in trying to diagnose as to why this is happening and then try to negotiate yourself as to why it's happening. You know what I mean? And so you want to be so vastly careful of going, hmm, now do I feel, now remember, this is just a Lori speaking here, okay? Do I feel as though there's a connection with learning that other people are coping with it and they may share it with you? Yes, I, I, I do believe so. Okay. However, I also want to be careful in saying that because very often parents walk around like they're pretty perfect in front of their kids. They don't want to see them upset. You know, you don't want your kids to see you upset. You don't want them to see you anxious. You don't want to see all that. And you think that you're actually doing them a service. Well, I don't want you walking around just dumping it on top of them. It also doesn't really set them up to see, oh, oh, well, I don't have to be perfect. Like, mom is stressed or dad is is upset about something. And that's why communication and, and being able to articulate your feelings is like ideal. Now I get it. Like my daughter's 14 and you know, it's hard to have a 50 year old to a 14 year old conversation and expect them to get that same thing. Right. And that's just from life skills. It's from knowing what you know. It's, you know, all of those things come into play. So you have to understand that the immediate response may be, 
I'm cutting off all communication to your friends. I'm taking your social media. I'm taking your phone. Okay. In my opinion, and I would definitely talk to your therapist about this. And if they don't have a therapist, make sure they get one or a coach of some sort, right? Somebody who has some kind of back background in this or has experience in it, even if it's a personal experience, right? It doesn't even have to be an educational experience, a personal experience. That's why there's like peer support groups and, and things like that that are often sometimes even more helpful than the therapy to the person who is doing self-harm. And so, you know, it's, you want to be careful because you immediately want to be like, that's it. I'm going to make sure that the house is safe. And I do agree with that. Like I have my kitchen knives put away in, in a, in a cabinet and I have it locked like with a padlock. Um, not every one of my cabinets, because I also don't want to walk around and make it seem as though it's so sterile that she can't live in here. Um, and then I also have a cabinet that has all of the medicines and vitamins and all that stuff. I have that locked up as well, literally with a padlock and I have the keys, um, you know, somewhere. So Yes. Do I want you to be able to do stuff like that? Absolutely. But I also want you to be very cautious in how this is um, affecting them and how it is affecting you. Because very often you don't want to make it about you, but in the same token, you are allowed to have your own emotions and your feelings behind this, right? So you got to give yourself the space and grace. That's why self-help and self-healing and, and all of those things come into play. Find yourself a good little, a good little source of support, whether it be your therapist, whether it be super close people around you. And you can also look into peer groups um, for yourself, okay? Uh, Parents of children who self-harm. There are a lot of different groups. There's some on Facebook. There's uh, other boards. I think there's a clubhouse on it. So it's, it's very important that you have it and don't try, or don't try. I want you to I was saying don't, and then I was going to say, I want you to try. This came out, don't try. That's not what I mean. I actually want you to try to not go into self-loathing of your own. Because when you find out very often, this is, it's not typical for it to be like day one. And now, you know, usually this has been over a process for me in my house. It's been probably almost a year, right? And so before, you know, I, I was, it was brought to my attention. And of course you can hindsight it. Oh, that made sense why this was happening. Or I found that and that made sense. And, you know, so you also want to be careful of that too. Try not to go back and be like, how could I have prevented this? What could I have done? Why didn't I do this differently? That's why you have to protect your own mental space too. Now, if in fact you are a parent of someone is self-harming, uh, and I, like I said, I personally, for me, my binge eating disorder was self-harm. Not that I was intentionally thinking this is self-harm. I was thinking these are a coping skill. And often self-harm goes into that coping strategy, right? I mean, it does. That's basically why you're why they're doing it. And it becomes a um, compulsion, right? It becomes a compulsion. So do I feel it feel um, as though this is linked to some form of OCD? Hmm. Possibly. Uh, I do feel as though other disorders play a huge factor in all of this. Okay. I I mean, I I truly do. I feel like uh, personality disorders can come into play. Um, borderline personality, opposition defiant disorder. Uh, There's, I mean, the list is kind of endless, right? Bipolar, uh, yes, depression, yes, anxiety. There's a multitude of things. So, and this is where I think the frustration for most people who are trying to pinpoint what mental direction of healing especially from a medicine perspective, like a medicine pharmaceutical pers- uh, perspective, it's tough because when when you are in a space, right? When you are in the space of allowing yourself to go through the sort of guinea pig stage, which I know that sounds awful and I don't mean it to be like, oh, people are just trying to figure it out. But ultimately, when you present, especially if someone is younger and they're presenting with uh, depression, okay? So typically, you're going to have your therapy and or uh, sometimes antidepressant. Boom, you're given the antidepressant. Now, here's how that works. Antidepressant may very well work and they work amazingly in so many people. However, if you have borderline personality, if you have bipolar, if you have a multitude of other things, now we have to look and say, hmm, 
Sometimes antidepressants are going to increase your agitation. It may throw you into a manic phase. It may, there's a couple th- things it can do if, in fact, you're struggling with something else, right? And I mean, sometimes even on its own. But if you're struggling with bipolar, very often they're cautious in giving you your an antidepressant because obviously it can throw you into mania. So it could be a mood stabilizer, something like a lamictal or even back in the day, like a um, lithium or, or something like that. So there's other medicines. But to be fair, very often, like as I was going through my healing process, and I also had borderline personality, I was actually therapized out of it. Um, because I obviously went through exposure therapy of my own long before I started doing alternative therapy as a practice. And so I was also diagnosed with borderline personality. And I know that mine came from a lot of the traumas. Plus, I truly believe that there's a form of hereditariness. <laughs> you know what I mean? I know that's not really a word, but, um, it, and so for borderline, as I started to learn coping st- uh, strategies and actually, actually DBT is fantastic for borderline, um, clients that's dial, di- blah, 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 blah. I cannot speak today because my dinging was going off and my ADHD kicked in and was like, Oh my God, turn that dinging off. <laughs> so I, t- yeah, so it's dialectical behavioral therapy. So when you are going through DBT, it actually helps you with mindfulness and it's, it's showing you a direction. I actually do a, a, a good form of that with, with a lot of my clients is, is DBT, even my non, uh, BPD clients. So in in my opinion, like I believe as though she was diagnosed with one thing, but we need a deeper diagnosis because I'm I'm pretty sure that I know it's a lot deeper and it will require a mood stabilizer, other coping strategies. And at some point it may or may not even include hospitalization and into a clinic. So I, and that's what I was going to say. If you are on uh, this new journey, or if you've been on this journey where you or someone that you know has been self-harming. You, it's you're gonna have to work with your support system, the psychiatrist, the therapist. Highly recommend that you have both of those. Your alternative therapist, like myself, like I pretty much complement the other two, right? Because it's about mindfulness. It kind of helps you through your DBT, and and so you know you can have a team. There's not a rule that says you need one person. There's not a rule that says if you take this medicine, this is the only medicine that's gonna work for you. Not true. It's sort of a guinea pig. It's it, it's it's a trial and error, right? Like, is this working? It's not working. Is this working? It's not working. And at some point, it becomes too much for the person to handle or the 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 person who's suffering mostly, right? It's not about you, but it is because you still have to protect yourself, right? You still have to help your your mental space. And so it may come to a point in time where there it, you may need to be inpatient for a little bit. It may be two weeks. It might be four weeks. It might be a couple visits. You don't know and you don't need to overthink it and overanalyze it. Okay. And so understanding that it, this is a process and it is difficult for the person who is self-harming. It is so difficult for them because not only do they not know how to process the emotion, maybe they're lacking the empathy of others and, and not, or to, not towards others, but towards self. And there's all of these things that come into play and you go, Oh my God, can you just like, I just want you to feel better. Of course. You don't think they want to feel better? 100%. It's, it's like a, it's a it's cycle. And like I said, it becomes a compulsion. And there is a level of shame and guilt that comes along with that for them. And for me, you know, I mean, and of course, I've done so much studying on this now, I feel like I'm, I'm an unverified expert in it, just because I think because I'm living with it. And as a person who does a lot of mental health work as a profession, you know, I've, I've talked to a lot of, of specialists, I've talked to I've done a lot of reading and worked with scientists and, and thought and looked at the biofeedback in brains and, and why does this happen? And, and so for me, my OCD takes me down the road of I must know this perfectly, <laughs> you know, and I know not perfectly, but you know what I mean, like, I must really understand it. And I think like, um, you may notice that your child or the person who is self and it doesn't have to be a child, by the way, it can also be an adult um, is who is self harming may start wearing long sleeves in the summertime, may not want to put on shorts in the summertime. Um, typical places are going to be the inner part of the arms down the thighs and on the hips, which is um, seems to be the specialty here. Um, and also sometimes by the ankles and they typically don't want it to be seen. But there comes a point in time where I believe there is something that they want to know. And in my case, with with my daughter, there was marks on her arm. And they were really easy, because we have two cats, to dismiss. So freaking easy. Because I play with my cats, and I literally look like my arm's been mauled, right? So it, it wasn't abnormal until... 
just the other day, literally, you know, I said, wait a minute, like my sixth sense kicked in. I was like, we need a conversation. And I kind of knew that the medicine wasn't working. And then there was a space where she was squirreling some medicine away that she wasn't taking. And so there's a, that's why I said, I think there's a lot deeper issue here going on. And so understanding that. And so when we talked about it, obviously, when she told me it was, I was a little bit like, okay, all right, let me process this for a minute. Cause she said, are you mad at me? And then she, immediately, sometimes, by the way, they will get defensive. Like, what, are you mad? And I was like, no, 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 I'm not mad. And so I, you got to know to pull back, right? Because you don't want to exacerbate it. And then you go down that rabbit hole of, well, where do I fit in? What's my role? How do I parent? If I push too much, it's a problem. It could be a trigger. If I don't push enough, then I'm not being a parent. Is it manipulation? Is it not manipulate? Like, there's this thing that's going to go in your brain and you're going to be like, oh my God, what can I do? And the one thing that you can do is allow yourself to process it, to process it. If you're going to cry for two days, go cry for two days. All right. Just don't stay there. Just don't stay there. But you got to be able to process it, be able to have some open communication. You want to let your child or the person who's doing self-harm know that you are there. Now, here's the thing. And this is going to be hard for a lot of parents or people who are um, in support of someone who is self-harming. This is going to be tough to hear. But, you know, my daughter said, listen, like I'm going to try but I can't promise you I'm going to stop. Like, I mean, it's kind of addicting. Like I, this, it's a compulsion for me. And the fact that she said that to me, I was like, thank you for that. You know, thank you so much for telling me that. And, you know, I, she said, I, I was looking for Neosporin. We didn't have any. So I picked up some Neosporin and, you know, she's, I said, listen, if, if you're comfortable talking to me, um, there will never be any judgment. If you had a hard time processing, just let me know and maybe I can help you clean the wound. Um, and so it is a process, right? It's, I know instinctively you're going to be like, I just want to take everything that you can't take their fingers from them. They can scratch themselves. They can do, there's, there's a way, right? And so you want to be really careful of the judgment because they're already sitting in self-judgment of themselves in the first place, right? Because that's how I was with my eating disorder, right? And you guys know I, I, I sort of, ba- blah, 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 I told you I can't speak today. Um, I sort of bounce through, I've been pretty good. Like I haven't really had a binge sort of moment over the last... I always have some level of a snacky binge and I, a little different than most people. Um, but nothing where I binge binge for a couple months. And then when it comes, I just go, okay, obviously it, they're less and fewer and far between. This is going to be something I'm probably going to battle with forever, but it's a psychological thing. And so why would that be any different? And so, you know, obviously you want to get to the person, you want to get, give the person tools and coping strategies that's going to redirect that. So they aren't creating that self-harm. But I promise you that is not an overnight thing. And you want them to start identifying triggers. And, you know, so we're really, I should say we, me and her with her treatment team are very early on in our treatment for this. Okay. Now, this is not new to her. She's been doing this for a while. But the treatment is. And it's about allowing yourself to verbalize it, to not automatically think that you did something wrong, not to feel shameful. Um, Because I'll tell you right now, if I go outside and we're walking down the beach and somebody says something to her about it, I would have no problem stepping in and not because I feel like I have to, but because I do need to let everybody know I'm, I'm good. We're good in this house. We're great. And it's funny because she said to me when we were in Myrtle Beach, she said, or what I told her the other day and she goes, mom, I thought you knew. And I was like, okay, first of all, have you met me? Because <laughs> hello, what do I do for a profession? And you know me. So I would have said something to you. You know what I mean? Like I would have been, I probably would have said it the most incorrect way too. I probably would have been like, what the hell? You know what I mean? And so it just sort of happened the way it did. And she goes, well, when we were in Myrtle Beach, you know, I went to the bathroom and I'm telling you, I did not see these marks on her leg. I am not, I'm not that clueless. I did not see them. And she said that, you know, she's going to the bathroom and somebody who was about 20 looked and saw her and point and not pointed it out, but knew what was going on and said, listen, I'm, I'm sorry. And she just said, mm, okay. She was like, mom, that was kind of weird. But, um, so, you know, it's understanding that very often there may be a level where they want you to know, but you're not going to typically know as soon as it happens, right? And so you got to be okay with that. And I know you want to help your child or, or the person. It might not, again, might not even be a child. It might be you. You might be listening to this and going, oh my God, I'm, I'm hiding this from everybody. And if you are, if you are the one that's doing the self-harm to yourself, I need you to hear this. 
oh my God, you are, there's nothing wrong with you as far as you're, you're not broken. (laughs) Okay. You're not broken. There is, you are beautiful. Okay. And you might be struggling in the area of trying to process what these emotions are. And you might feel shameful because you don't know how to do it. Let me be the first one to tell you most of us don't know how to do it. Okay. Some of us, we internalize. Some of it may not be as obvious as the physicality of the self-harm that you may be doing. But I promise you that if you reach out for help, talk to your therapist, get a therapist, talk to your psychiatrist, be okay with taking meds if you need to, be okay with finding your one or two people. Now we have not gotten to that place of having a plan. It's it's called a support plan, but we are going to start that this week. Actually, we're going to start a support plan Monday, a support plan Tuesday. And, you know, we're supposed to be heading off to Florida on Friday. Um, I have, it was my birthday gift from a client of mine to go to West Palm. So we get to live like ballers for a week. Um, And so I would still like to be able to take her, right? Unless the doctor says, oh, we think maybe inpatient is best. I think she should be able to go and then we'll see. I mean, we're going to probably do a medicine tweak and this is where I have to now step in, right? And like, what I mean by step in is I kind of have to uh, go from parent to practitioner and I plan on it, like saying, okay, you know what? Try to step away, try to do the boundaries, but no, no, no. It's time. Like I pretty much know this is what I think she's got. This is why I think she's got it. This is how I would dose her out. What do you think? You know what I mean? And because I mean, now I have the benefit of being able to do that. But even if you don't have the benefit of being able to do that, you need to be the advocate of your person. And if you are the person who is on that side where you are the one that is struggling, you have got to find somebody who will advocate for you as well as you're advocating for yourself. But sometimes, you know, you're in your brain. So it's hard because all you want to do is feel better. But I promise you that there's things like, okay, the coping strategies, mindfulness, meditation, yoga, putting puzzles together, going for a walk, going for a run, working out, taking a bath. Like these are all things that are not miracle cures. They're just tools in your toolbox and and coping strategies. But know that it's going to take you time. And know that if you're the parent or a support system of somebody who is who is doing self harm, you got to take care of yourself too. All right. Like I said, allow yourself to fall apart. Allow it. Oh my God. Allow it. Allow it. Allow it. Okay. Sit with it. Because once again, if you're not allowing yourself to sit with it, then how in the world can you explain to your child or the person who is suffering? And how can you say, okay, I need you to process A, B, C, D, E, but you're not processing A, B, C, D, E. You too have to go through it. You have to process the emotions. The person struggling has to process the emotions and it, it's, it may be done differently. It may be done together. Typically it's going to be differently, right? Different times. And so understanding that, you know, if you are stressed and if you feel like you're helpless, if you feel like you're hopeless, like there's the suicide prevention line, right? And while I think people get this a little mixed up, but when people self-harm doesn't mean that they're going to try to commit suicide. Oh, believe me, I know how you could say what? Like now, do I believe that there is an increase there? And I've talked to some other scientists and, and sort of mental professionals who said, yeah, I mean, there's obviously, if that's happening, about 70% more <laughs> of an opportunity for that to happen, of course. But you, you can't sit there and worry about that. You can't go, if this happens, that happens. If this happens, that happens. This could ha- Your brain's going to do it. Let it process it. Okay? And you don't have to alert the media. You don't have to tell everybody on the planet about what's going on. But it is nice to have one or two people. Now, you know, I'm I'm usually pretty honest with my kid and, and saying, you know, hey, this is this is my support system, and and she knows, right? Like she's got her support system. I got mine. Um, and you know, it's it's about creating that and allowing yourself the space and grace to do that. But understand that you know people say things like, "Oh my gosh, you talk about everything that goes on in your life like it's no big deal." Are you kidding me? Of course it's a big deal. But what am I going to do? Sit in a closet with it? If, am I? I mean, obviously, I mean, well, I guess it is kind of like Facebooking. I'm putting this out in Pod World, but different. <laughs> and so you know, I would though. I mean, it's because here is the thing: we know, like this is this is how our our this is my reality, right? This this is my reality. This is my family's reality. This is my podcast. So if I'm going to sit here and I'm going to say to you, whether it be YouTube or whether it be Facebook or whether it be TikTok or whether it be here, if I'm going to say, hey, self-love, do this, do this, stand up, meditate, da, 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 I got to be honest with you. I got to be honest on my struggles, which is why I'm really good at my job. The education, great, love it, cool. That's awesome. But guess what? 
does not hold a candle to my experience. Does not. I could have seven degrees from Yale does not hold a candle to my experience. And so when I'm sharing this with you, and this is literally something that I'm going through as we speak, as we speak. And, you know, I'll try to do a, um, a follow-up a couple months down the road and be like, hey, remember this? Here we are. And I'll do a lot on Insta story. I mean, obviously she knows, like, this is, this is my life. Outside of just helping people individually on telesession and stuff like that, I'm also out there. And so speaking about it when you don't speak about it is when I believe it becomes problematic. Because then to me, it appears as though I'm, I'm, I'm ashamed of it or I'm, I've, I feel bad for it towards other people. And I feel bad, at, bad that this is where she is in her part right now. But feeling bad and hiding it isn't going to fix it. And so sitting and working with it and, and, and working with a support team, understanding, guys, if this is you, if you are a person who is self-harming, I promise you that if you give yourself the space to help learn these coping strategies, you can, you can get on the other side of it, but you got to be patient. And if you're a parent or a support system for someone who is doing self-harm, Yes, get them the help. But here is the deal. You can't make somebody do their coping strategies. You can't look and go, you better meditate. You can't look and go, you better go for a walk, right? So that's why you want to work with the person who is suffering or struggling. You want to work with their support system and you want to come up with a strategy. You want it to be a balance and reward, right? Because in the real world, people are not just going to hold your feelings. People are not going to be like, ooh, Oh, okay. You have a history of self-harm. So I'm going to be a little nicer to you. That is not how the real world is going to work. That is not how the real world is going to operate with you. However, learning the coping skills out of compassion, out of safety, out of grace, out of kindness, it's going to show you that there is a baby step there. Yes, there's going to be a little push. Yes, there's going to be a little like, okay, what's next up? And understanding that you cannot control another human being, even if it's your child. Even if it's your child, you can direct them, you can give. But if you start losing yourself in that space where you can't function, that is not going to be effective. So allow yourself the space and grace. Allow yourself the time and understand that you are not in this alone. I did find something on my travels that I did forward over to her. And just said, hey, just so you have it. I don't know if she's ever going to use it. But I said, hey, this is a, I saw it like in, in one of my many travels of, of learning about this. There is a number, 741741, right? You got that? I'm going to say it again. 741741. It will also be in the show notes along with the suicide prevention line as well. And apparently if you text that and you're struggling, that's like a, it's like a text, right? It's like you have somebody other on the other end texting back and apparently it's a 24 seven. So I did pass on that information and all you can do is provide the tools and try to be the best support system without losing yourself in the process of that, right? So in closing of this, just know, right? These are things, welcome to the world of mental health. Welcome to the world, not even a mental health, Welcome to the world. It's not black and white. It's not just one way. There's struggles. And the struggles of self-harm for coping have many hats, have many faces, many faces. Do not think that it's just one face to this. Don't think that, oh, this person's goth. This is what they do. Not true. You don't know that to be factual. There's lawyers. There's doctors. There's other people who are struggled or struggling or have struggled with something like this. So don't look down upon yourself or your family or the person who's struggling because I promise you this, okay? Everybody has a story. But if you worry about, you know, what does this look like and, 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 and what does this mean to the family and is it this dirty little secret, that's where it becomes problematic, all right? And understand, listen, it's hard. It's hard. How do you think it is for the person struggling? But it's also hard for you right? So give yourself the space and grace, try to have open communication, build in a, a, a learning tool system and um, just be kind to yourself. It's, it's not an overnight fix, right? Find support for others and find support for you. 
But in the meantime, I am here for you. I'm going through it as we speak. Um, feel free to jump over to the Facebook group. I don't check it tons, but I promise I will. Um, that's the Positivity Experience podcast. Uh, and then, of course, my Instagram. I always ask that you consider following that in my TikTok. Definitely my Instagram and my YouTube as well, um, because I do Insta stories and we can talk about it. You can jump into the DMs. Um, you know, there's a lot of good support systems. And if you want more feedback on this, and if you want me to talk about other things like this, please let me know in the comments. I appreciate you guys each and every week. And remember, be kind to everybody else. But first and foremost, please be kind to yourself. Check it out.